No capitalist shall escape in this time These words were spoken by the swan So run capitalists Run and socialize with the sorrow Comrades, um, we have been through some difficult periods in the last two years. The crisis of uh, imperialism has got much deeper and it's producing all kinds of ramifications. There are attacks on the working class everywhere, not only in this country, but in every capitalist country. Imperialism is trying to find a way out of this crisis by shoving the burden of the crisis onto the backs of the working class. Who else? Because capitalist shoulders are never broad enough to share any burden. They are only there to take the profit, but not to share the burden. And also, of course, the burden is especially harsh on the oppressed nations, which are the object of imperialist aggra aggression everywhere, from Iraq to Afghanistan to Syria and many other countries in, in the in, 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 in the planning of imperialism, who are the targets of its attacks. Lenin once said that like every crisis in the life of individuals or in the history of nations, war oppresses and breaks some, steals and enlightens others. Now you would have had the experience in the last two years of actually seeing it in practice, how the wars against the people of Iraq, the people of Syria, the people of um, Afghanistan have actually broken some and stealed others. All the opportunists have simply collapsed in the face of the onslaught of imperialist propaganda. One way or the other, their job is to defend the positions that imperialism adopts. Whatever their formal terminology, basically they adopt a position which constitutes a sport for their own imperialist bourgeoisie. Our party can be proud of the fact that it has emerged through this crisis and it has emerged through this crisis steeled and enlightened rather than broken. We are not the party that is broken, it's our opponents who might even have more members than us who are broken have absolutely not, nothing to say on the subject. Of course, we are only able to do that because our party, and here of course I have to commend the young comrades who've taken the lead in this matter, has actually been in the business of taking seriously the study of the science of revolution, the science of Marxism and Leninism. They are in a very painstaking, not very glorious in the sense that every time you do this work it brings you immediate recognition. They've been doing this work day to day, holding study classes and holding party schools, weekend schools, and enlightening our members. Because unless our members are enlightened, unless they're guided by the revolutionary theory, there will be no revolutionary movement worth talking about. And it's a weakness of the British working class. The British have this habit of setting a fashion, really. And when they were, the, the British bourgeoisie introduced religion in a big way in the 19th century. All the French and the other bourgeoisies used to jeer at the, the British bourgeoisie, how backward they are, they're going back to religion. And of course, once the working class movement arose, they realized that the British bourgeoisie was very clever. We must go back to it before we, this malicious little boy, I, the proletariat, actually begin to understand the world. So they introduced everything backward. Now, one thing that the British bourgeoisie has been able to inculcate in the British working class ever since its inception is theoretical backwardness. And Engels noted it long while ago. And he said, what a misfortune and immeasurable disadvantage it is for the working class to be lacking in the sense of revolutionary theory is, uh, can, may be seen from the indifference towards all theory, which is one of the main reasons why the English working class movement crawls along so slowly. And we need to put that right, and our party recognizes that it's got to be done. And we are able to do that by saying things which are not always very popular. We're able to do that because, because we, we are able to say, no, this is right, because our theoretical insight actually enables us to move ahead of other people. And we're able to move ahead of it before people actually are able to realize by their own experience what we're saying. 
Sometimes people say to us, why do you say that? People don't understand it at the moment. But they never will understand unless we raise it. Because when you raise it, it's unpopular. In his very early writings, Marx said, the honor of the Workers' Party demands that it should reject illusions even before their hollowness is exposed by experience. The working class is revolutionary or it's nothing. So if we don't put forward a position which puts the working class in a revolutionary position, we have absolutely nothing to say in the circumstances. And we have been saying, saying that at a time when we raised the question, victory to the resistance, we were often reproached, you are actually putting off everybody in the broad movement. We probably did. I think there was an element of truth in that. We probably did. Now you go to a doctor and you have a diagnosis. And the doctor says, you got cancer. You're not going to like the doctor, are you? But equally, you're not going to like the doctor if he says, you're wonderful. And three months later, you die of it and nobody can actually take care of you. So, as we know only from our own personal sad losses, every disease is not curable. But at least you have the chance to actually tackle it if there is an opportunity. And that's what we do. If there are diseases in the working class movement, in our view, they're curable and we have a duty in, in the struggle to cure, cure that disease. And this theoretical weakness and opportunism in the working class movement are, of course, very um, much of a disease which needs to be cured. We have, again, it's not very popular. When you say, we are on the side of the oppressed, we are on the side of the people who are the target of our own bourgeoisie, people don't like it. We say there is opportunism in the working class movement. There is a material base. It's not something wrong with the blood of the English or the British or the, or the American or the French workers. If there is an opportunism, you have got to find out what exactly is causing that opportunism. And we say it's the material reality of a handful of tiny imperialist countries living off at the expense of hundreds upon hundreds of millions of exploited colonial and semi-colonial slaves. Now, when we raise this question, I mean, I used to raise this question 40 years ago. So they said, used to say to me, so you want the standard of living of the British working class to come down? No, I don't. I want every British worker to be living in a palace like Buckingham Palace. But it's not my desire that would make, give residence in Buckingham Palace to the British workers. It is the material conditions. And we are saying that this material condition which produces opportunism actually is an enemy of the working class. Because if the workers are fobbed off with a sop, with a few benefits over and above that which um, would be available if there, was no opportun uh, if there was no imperialist exploitation, actually put off the day of revolution, i.e. namely the liberation of the working class. We are not in the favor of lowering the standard of living of any worker. We are in favor of raising that standard of living. It's the workings and the unfolding of the capitalist crisis which actually bring down the standard of the work living of the workers. And we say to the workers, you must think out of the box. You must not try and see that there's a solution to your problems within the system of capitalism. And that's what we have been, have been trying, trying to do. <laughs> we can learn from experience of humanity. We can learn from the experience of our contingents in other countries. If the Bolsheviks made a revolution, it isn't because there was something special about the blood of the Russians. It is because their leadership was able to understand what needed to be done in the fight against Tsarist autocracy and against Tsarist imperialism. They were most concerned with that question, and precisely for that reason, they stood in those days when the question of the independence or national liberation was considered to be a question which mainly concerned Europe. The only question that was ever discussed those days was the question either of independence of Ireland or the independence of Poland. As to the independence of the vast masses living in the continents of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, this was not even envisioned. And as to the credit of the Bolsheviks, they came along and they said, unless and until, and this is in the words of Lenin, the revolutionary movement in the advanced countries would actually be a sheer fraud. In their if in their struggle against capital, the workers of Europe and America were not closely and completely united with hundreds upon hundreds of millions of colonial slaves 
who are oppressed by capital, by, by, the, by our own bourgeoisie. Now, that is something important. It's precisely because the Bolsheviks understood that. It's precisely because the Bolsheviks had a revolutionary policy towards the advanced nations. It was one of the reasons that the Bolshevik Revolution was successful. It was the very basis for the formation of that wonderful family of nations living together in fraternal harmony rather than fratricidal warfare that constituted the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, to my mind, shall forever continue as an eloquent example that speaks to humanity that this is what happens to human beings when exploitation has been eliminated. <laughs> the former oppressed nations and the former oppressing nation, the great Russians, the oppressors, and the former oppressed nations, the Georgians, the Tajiks, the Kazakhs, the Arme Armenians, Azerbaijanis, all of them could live together in that Soviet Union. And had you been to that Soviet Union during that time, you would have seen what a pleasure it was to visit. Not a smell of racism, not a smell of disdain for the oppressed nations. And that is really what we look forward to. And yet that is the country, that is the state that is most maligned. For, by the bourgeoisie for obvious good reasons. The bourgeoisie are not stupid. But the stupid ones are the Trotskyites and revisionists who follow that line and condemn the Soviet Union. I don't mind if my enemies abuse my mother, but I do mind if my friends abuse my mother. The Soviet Union was the fatherland of the working class. It was the first working class state that was viable after the Paris Commune, which did not last very long. It had great achievements to its credit, and our party is proud to defend those achievements and stand by those achievements, and the leaders who led that revolution, Lenin and Stalin, we are in no way ashamed of that and we will always do it. As Stalin said, it was formally accepted idea that the world has been divided from time immemorial into inferior and superior races, into blacks and whites, of whom the former are unfit for civilization and are doomed to be objects of exploitation, while the latter are the only vehicles of civilization whose mission it is to exploit the former. This legend must now be regarded as shattered and discarded. One of the most important results of the October Revolution is that it has dealt this legend a mortal blow, having demonstrated that liberated non-European nations drawn into the channel of Soviet development are not a bit less capable of promoting a really progressive culture and a really progressive civilization than are the European nations. And we Robeson said, when I traveled in Africa, the European colonizers used to say, for a thousand years, nothing could be done to Africa to make it civilized, to make it self-governing, etc. He said then he visited the Soviet Union, and he saw the formerly most backward people drawn into the work of Soviet construction, and he said 10 years had brought them onto the level with their fellow workers in other parts of the Soviet Union. So it's not thousand years, but ten years. And he was hated for saying that. From become, being a very famous and excellent artist, earning those days hundred thousand dollars a year, he was, a, attempt was made to reduce him to a non-entity, where his actually income went down to five thousand dollars. But he stood his ground, and like Galileo, he said, the Soviet Union still works. <laughs> Sometimes, our uh, ever so left-wing revisionists and Trotskyites refuse to support the liberation struggle of the backward people. And they compare very favorably their own imperialist countries with the backward countries. They say, we've got freedom here, freedom to speech here, after all, we're legally holding a congress here, so it's a great example of freedom, if you like, we, we, we have here. But it always reminds me of the following words of Marx written in 1856 in regard to Ireland. No, sorry, Engels. Ireland may be regarded as the first English colony and as one which, because of its proximity, is still entirely governed in the old way. 
and one can already notice here that the so-called liberty of English citizens is based on the oppression of the colonies. Mm -hmm. Ireland, of course, when it was the only colony, was greatly oppressed. When it joined a long list, it was equally oppressed. And even today, a part of Ireland continues to be occupied by British imperialism. And our party is proud to support the struggle of the Irish people for liberation of their entire country, unification of Ireland as a single nation and as a single country. And we shall always continue to do that. they are fighting for the rights of liberation of the colonies far away, very often have a tendency to forget about Ireland. Ireland must never be forgotten. And the nationalist community has adopted a new tactic of uniting Ireland, and we have actually also a duty to say that if that's what they want to do, we shall support their struggle to try a different method. As Jerry Adams said, We've been trying to liberate Ireland for 700 years. We failed. There must be something wrong we're doing, and there's some, must, something must be right that Brit British are doing right. So we have to try a, 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 a new method. I don't want to join the long queue of those British revolutionaries who want to fight to the last drop of blood of every foreigner because this is what satisfies their pure theor theoretical thought. In actual struggles, people make compromises at various stages. A person who refuses to maneuver, a person who refuses to change tactics if that is very necessary, a person who refuses to compromise is unfit to be a revolutionary leader of the working class. Mm. Of course, every attempt is being made to sap our energies. If the Soviet Union is condemned by the bourgeoisie, and in its way, by the revisionist and Trotsky, there's a reason for that. The idea is to show nothing works. You might as well work with the present system. Better the devil you know. Capitalism is horrible. It exploits workers. It heaps misery on them. It turns them into fodder for war on a regular basis. It kills millions of people. But it's the devil we know. It's fine. We can put up with it. Funnily enough, the present crisis of imperialism, without the leadership of the working class anywhere, has shattered people's faith in capitalism. And yet, attempts are being made to sap the faith of the working class in anything better. Deborah sent me a link to a program on Karl Marx produced by the BBC. It's done by a very intelligent young lady uh, who is an uh, economic correspondent for the BBC, Stephanie Flanders. It, gave a brilliant exposition of what Marx had to say about capitalism. What capitalism does, of course, its achievements. Every capitalist can talk about the achievements of capitalism. <laughs> so they, they take that. It also said it's a flawed system. The flaw cannot be cured. Again, it can be accepted. But what cannot be accepted is what will come in its place. And Stephanie Flanders says it's really irritating. Marx doesn't say if it's flawed, it's so bad and can't be cured, but if you go in its place. <laughs> Every one of you in this hall knows what Marx has to say, but it's good to go in its place. <laughs> Stephanie Flanders could at least have said, mentioned Marx really was of the opinion that what will replace capitalism is the dictatorship of the proletariat, which is a revolutionary transitional stage between the overthrow of capitalism and the achievement of the hard stage of capitalism. That would not be difficult. Stephanie Flanders, I'm sure, knows that she's an intelligent woman. But if you work for the BBC, then there's a limit to how much you can talk about, about Marx. So they're saying, fine, capitalism really doesn't work. It really is flawed. They even explained it. They didn't use the word, the uh, crisis of overproduction. But it was all there. Yes. The workers who are exploited cannot buy the wares that are produced by capitalism. So it's flawed. It cannot be cured. It goes from crisis to crisis. And, but of course, nothing can be put in its place. <laughs> As Stalin used to say, the chief endeavor of the bourgeoisie of all countries and of all its hangers on is to kill in the working class the faith in its own strength, faith in the possibility and inevitability of its victory, and thus perpetuate capital slavery. That's really the purpose of this. And we must see through it. And we must take it to the workers, even in the darkest corners of Britain and in the darkest times we're living through. 
I'm saying there literally is a light at the, at the end of the tunnel. Not light at the end of the tunnel that the bourgeoisie presents you with, because the light at the end of the tunnel is usually a train coming in the opposite direction. <laughs> right? But we actually have a light at the end of the tunnel. Socialism will liberate humanity. Uh, it's no longer at the experimental stage, because we've seen the actual experience of building of socialism. If socialism was destroyed in the Soviet Union, it wasn't because there was any fault of socialism. It is because Khrushchevite revisionism wrecked the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and wrecked its economic policy by, far, far, by instituting mark, market socialism and correspondingly with it conducting propaganda which was basically anti-communist over a period of time. Even then it took the revisionists 35 years to destroy the Soviet Union. And people who have lost that, you, if you go into the former Soviet Union, there's no demonstration without huge numbers of portraits of Stalin, more than that of Lenin. Not because they regard Stalin higher than Lenin, it's basically because Stalin was much maligned by the revisionists and the bourgeoisie, and it was in the name of fighting against Stalinism and going to true communism that revisionism restored capitalism in the former Soviet, Soviet Union. So people have actually seen that. I actually know some East Europeans here who are very happy they got, got their liberty now that the com communism had gone. And they're saying 20 years later, like all fools learn rather late, <laughs> things were rather good under the old system. I meet Romanians, I meet Poles, mm -hmm. and sometimes they're right wing, and they still say things were better under the old system. Because the, under the new system, a couple of dozen thieves in every country have stolen the wealth built by people over a period of 30, 40, 70 years, as in the case of the Soviet Union. And now they can see what's happening. I, at the last Congress, gave uh, a quotation from Marx, which, with which I'm going to finish uh, my opening remarks. And it, it, unfortunately, we have waited too long in this case, but all the same, it's correct. It was made in regard to the British working class, how soon the English workers will free themselves from their apparent bourgeois infection. One must wait and see. Only the small German petty bourgeois, who measure world history by the yard and the latest interesting news in the papers, would imagine that in developments of such magnitude, 20 years are no more than a day. Though later on, there may come days in which 20 years are embodied. I think that events that have been taking place, notwithstanding in, uh, in attempts of imperialism to mani manipulate those even, events that have been taking place in uh, the Middle East, in other parts of the world, and to a certain extent also in the advanced imperialist countries, give us hope to think that Marx was absolutely right, that nothing has happened for so many years, but that we may actually, sooner than we imagine, come to see those days in which 20 years are, or 30 years or 40 years are embodied. And it's with this view that the Congress must actually hold its debates. It must chalk out a program of work for the next two years so that when we come back, we have great successes to report. We're much strengthened and much um, more resilient uh, and viable party than we are even today. But I'd like to thank all of you and congratulate all of you for all the work that you've done during the last two years to make this Congress the success that I already see it is. And I hope at the end of its work, at the end of tomorrow, you will see that it's been a worthwhile effort. Thank you so much. Thank you. Why, boys, we're at the end of an age. We live in a land of weather forecasts, breakfasts that set in, shat on by Tories, shoveled up by Labour, and here we are.